don't know how many deals a year like this you're doing, but if you're doing just for round numbers, a hundred of these per year. So is it like maybe five of those you have to worry about that or 10 or one or none? I don't know. What would you say? What kind of payment terms do you want to see? Like how long should the amortization schedule be? Are we talking like one, three, five, 10, 30 years? Like how long is normal, I guess? And then for the instances where you kind of jump into an existing one, like how much more is there left to go before the thing matures and is paid off? Yeah, that's a great question. So my advice for that is to always go with as short a term as possible because that will really improve or reduce the discount required when you sell your loan. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I recommend is to go with about a 9.9 .9 to 10% interest rate mm -hmm. because interest rate and term are the two most important parts to the discount when you go to sell the loan. Mm -hmm. So if you have like a 3% interest rate, it's called a coupon rate, and you want to sell it at a 12% yield, you can see that you're going to take a huge reduction in the loan balance to get that up to 12%. So the other thing that I like to see is the 2% rule. I don't always see this, but it's nice. So my purchase price, whatever my purchase price is, I like to see the payment as 2% per month of that purchase price. Mm -hmm. But Ultimately, what I'm doing is I'm just crunching the numbers in a financial calculator based on my kind of risk assessment mm -hmm. and what I would like to achieve. And it's going to spit out a purchase price. Mm -hmm. That is my offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I just thinking as I hear you talking. So a while back, I created this spreadsheet where you could basically plug in the value of a property and it would spit out like five different scenarios for how you could make an offer to a seller. One of them would be like just a super discounted cash offer. And then the other four would be different combinations of seller financing where that seller is financing it to you as the buyer. And the beauty of it is that, you know, you can ultimately pay anything for a property if the person is just willing to finance it for terms that are favorable enough to you. And it kind of sounds like a similar concept to this where, you know, like, like we mentioned earlier, the credit score can be terrible as long as you're willing to have a, a big enough down payment. It'd be interesting to create some kind of a similar spreadsheet. Maybe you even have one where you can plug in any scenario and it will just tell you, this is what has to give. You know, if this problem exists, this is how you fill it in by asking for this concession. Do you think it's possible to create that kind of thing? I mean, it seems like it could. So I have that for, I have a credit matrix mm -hmm. that is a combination of credit score and down payment required, mm -hmm. but absolutely. I mean, that's how I I bid the loans is just based yeah. on what do I think the risk is and what do I think is an appropriate yield and then what purchase price will translate into that yield. Yeah. This question is kind of going back in time to what we were talking about earlier regarding the loan servicing and collection of payments. So if you take over an existing note and say they're using software or something, can you switch over to your loan servicer of choice at that point? Or is it kind of like, nope, sorry, this is the track it's on. This is how you got to finish it. That's what I always do. I have a um, transfer. Okay. You need to send out servicing transfer letter to the borrower, mm. informing them that moving forward, their payments will be collected by the servicer. Mm. And it's just a matter of transferring. They need a copy of the, all the loan documents. They need to know the balance, the monthly payment, mm. late fee, all that information. Mm. And it's a little more complicated than just the servicer to servicer transfer. Mm. But I highly recommend that. Mm. And I guess going back to what we were talking about in terms of, you know, finding ways to remedy what would otherwise be, you know, bad lending decisions just by asking for a higher down payment or whatnot. So in those scenarios where this borrower clearly has some problems, like there's reason to be concerned. And that's why you fill in the gaps by asking for these additional things. So I have to assume if you're doing that, you come across borrowers who default on their payments after you take over the loan, right? Like how common would that be after you're doing all this proper groundwork to make sure it's a good credit and something that's gonna actually pay over time? So in my experience, it's relatively low. I don't think I have had a borrower yet ever who just, well, okay, I take that back. Maybe a couple who just stopped paying and just walked away. That's extremely rare. Like immediately after you take um, over? No, I've never had that. Okay, I had that actually in one situation, but it was complicated because it involved a bankruptcy mm. and the individual decided that they didn't want to continue in their bankruptcy plan. Mm. 
but it's exceedingly rare. And I do believe that that is really tied to down payment. When somebody hands over $15,000, the likelihood that they're just going to walk away Mm. with a decent credit score of 660 or above is low to the point that I am comfortable purchasing those loans. Mm -hmm. Because if it does happen, I'm comfortable with the default process, Mm -hmm. but it's rare. True. And like, I have to assume, like, you're ready for it. If somebody defaults, like, you know exactly what to do. You're not scared of that. You just follow, you know, the appropriate process to get that done. So I guess you said it's relatively uncommon. Like, I don't know if you're, I don't know how many deals a year like this you're doing, but if you're doing just for round numbers, a hundred of these per year. So is it like maybe five of those you have to worry about that or 10 or one or none? I don't know. What would you say? Under 10%. Under 10%? Okay. Okay probably more along the lines of 5%. Okay. Does that ever become a problem where like you hit a snag and you can't resolve it or it takes way longer than you expect or it's more expensive than you thought it would be or do you pretty much have your process ironed out so that like there's no surprises in that process? So yes, you never know what a borrower is going to do during the foreclosure process. Most of the time with land, they're just probably going to walk away. A lot of times that you can convince them to do what's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure Mm -hmm. and just say, hey, you know, I'll give you some money if you just deed the property back to Mm -hmm. me, if it has clear title, that's an option. Mm -hmm. But if a borrower really wants to keep the property, you know, they might hire an attorney, they might fight the foreclosure, they might file bankruptcy. There's a lot of things that could happen. In the land, it's relatively rare because most of the time, you know, they're not living on the land. So they're probably more likely to to either just give it back or do a deed in lieu of foreclosure. 